All right, my name is Rod Ferguson, and I'm the Chair of Women's Gender Sexuality Studies. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our 2022 Brudner event. This is a very special um, moment for us because this is the first time that we've had it since the lockdown. Um, the Brudner Prize, established in 2000, is awarded annually to an accomplished scholar, artist, or activist whose work has made significant con contributions to LGBT studies and LGBT communities. All right, we have uh, decided to pluralize that this evening with the panel. Um, and tonight's panelists certainly fit that description. Our event is named after James Brudner, who was an AIDS activist, urban planner, journalist, and photographer, a man of wit and compassion, outsized knowledge and curiosity. Brudner valued both academic inquiry and direct action. He spent 12 years as a policy analyst for the city of New York, he also earned an MA in journalism from New York University and wrote for various publications on gay and AIDS-related topics. He became a member of ACT UP, the Treatment Action Group, and other organizations after the death of his twin brother, Eric, of AIDS in 1987. He worked on treatment and prevention issues with the National Institutes of Health, pharmaceutical corporations, and federal agencies. In his final years, he devoted much of his time to traveling the back roads of rural America with a camera. La Mama Gallery in New York mounted an exhibition of his photographs in 1997. He died of AIDS-related illness on September 18th, 1998, at the age of 37. Through his will, he established the Brudner Prize at Yale as a, quote, perpetual annual prize, end quote, for scholarship and activism on gay and lesbian history and contemporary experience. Our thanks go first to the Brudner executors, Stephen Carlin, Michael Cormier, and Ben Pesner. Also, we'd like to thank the w WGSS staff, Ellen Kupo, Mo Gardner, Keith Garriak, and Linda Relia for the support that they offered. Our thanks also to Rick Leone from Yale Broadcast Center for AV Support, our thanks also go to the LGBT Studies Committee, uh, made up of Jill Richards, the committee chair, Joe Fischel, Scott Herring, and Greta LaFleur. Particularly, we want to thank Joe for organizing tonight's panel. Joe, who is the author of Screw Consent, A Better Politics of Sexual Justice and Sex and Harm in the Age of Consent, will introduce the panelists. Please welcome Joe Fischel. Uh, hi everyone and thank you Rod. Uh, great, so yeah, thank you, welcome to the Brudner. Um, I'm going to keep my comments short uh, and then I will introduce the speakers and the introductions will also be short. Uh, I apologize that I'm going to lift my introductions right from the program that you are holding, uh, which we lifted from their, their website. So. Uh, but the point of keeping it short is that you can hear them uh, and not me. Um, so uh, before the, the question I will soon pose to our panelists uh, is anchored by two, or, we could, or might, we could think of as anchored by two geopolitical phenomena. The first, Russia's war against Ukraine. Uh, and even the most uh, materialist, intersectional feminist scholar uh, wonders sometimes, um, isn't all of that sex and gender stuff superfluous or epiphenomenal to the brutality and violence of war? Of course, uh, many scholars and some scholars in this room uh, have, uh, uh, have, have uh, wrote, written about the imbrication of war making, war legitimation, and insistent normativity around sex and gender. Uh, many have pointed out uh, Russian officials and pundits, how Russian officials and pundits uh, have drawn on gayness, gender non normativity uh, as threats to Russia, Russian civilization, uh, and children in particular, uh, to authorize Russian aggression. Uh, and its arrogation of power. So the uh, second anchor point uh, may be a surprise to nobody. Um, uh, we could take the anxiety generating, we could take anxiety generating stock 
uh, of, the dem of the legislative attack on women, queer, girls and women, queer kids and trans kids, an attack ever more vicious and lethal against girls, women, and queer and trans kids minoritized along other axes of inequality, race, class, citizenship, status. If commentators note uh, the rhetorics of gender and sexual normativity that scaffold Russian authoritarianism, we might observe how anti-gay, anti-trans, and anti-women legislation uh, uh, rests extraordinary regulatory surveillance and punitive power into the hands of our legislators. So a thought behind the question, what is sexual justice, is how to think those phenomena and those dangers together, even as the scale of our scholars' answers uh, will travel from the couple form to the planetary. So that's kind of all I've got by way of scaffolding. Um, I'm going to introduce our speakers and kind of more formally ask them to ask them this question. Um, so I uh, wish the font were bigger. Okay. So uh, Paisley Kara is a professor of political science and women and gender studies uh, at Brooklyn College and the Graduate Center of CUNY. Uh, professor Kara has written widely on transgender issues, including on topics such as discrimination and sex reclassification and the transgender rights movement. He is the author and editor of over 30 articles and books and co-founder of the leading journal in transgender studies, TSQ, Transgender Studies Quarterly. Kara's newest book, Sex Is, there's a typo here, Sex Is as Sex Does, Governing Transgender Identity, will be uh, released in the spring of 2022 by NYU Press. I should say that uh, my lecture, Gender Justice Power Institutions, had the extraordinary opportunity to read Professor Kara's, some of Professor Kara's book and also uh, text of our other uh, panelists today, um, which has been fantastic. Um, che Gossett uh, is the Racial Justice Postdoctoral Fellow, uh, uh, in Initiative for a Just Society at the Center for Contemporary Critical Thought at Columbia University. Che Gossett is a black non-binary femme writer. They will be a visiting scholar at the Center for Life Writing at Wolfson College, Oxford University in 2022-23. Uh, Gossett was a 2019-2020 Helena Rubinstein Fellow in Critical Studies in the Whitney Independent Study Program, as well as a 2020-2021 Graduate Fellow at the Center for Cultural Analysis at Rutgers University. They also co-edited with Professor David Getze. I love David Getze. They uh, <laughs> co-edited with Professor David Getze uh, a syllabus on trans and non-binary methods for Art Journal, which just recently received the 2022 CAA Journal Award. Uh, Tay Meadow, Associate Professor of Sociology at Columbia University, tenured like last week, so yay. Um, uh, professor Meadow is Associate Professor of Sociology at Columbia. Uh, her, uh, her research and writing on gender, sexuality, and intimacy centers deep ethnographic immersion and in-depth interviewing. She's the author of Trans Kids, Being Gendered in the 21st Century, and co-editor of Other Please Specify, Queer Methods in Sociology, as well as numerous scholarly titles. She is currently completing a new ethnographic book, tentatively titled Edge Play, The Erotic Life of Social Difference. Uh, Shatima Threadcraft, Associate Professor of Gender and Sexuality Studies, Philosophy and Political Science at Vanderbilt University. Professor Threadcraft is the author of Intimate Justice, The Black Female Body and the Body Politic, uh, which was the winner of the National Women's Studies Association Sarah H. Whaley Award for the Best Book on Women and Labor, the 2017 W.E.B. Du Bois Distinguished Book Award from the National Conference of Black Political Scientists, and finally, the 2017 Best Book Award for the American Political Science Association's Race, Ethnicity, and Politics Organized Section. It's an awesome book. Uh, so those are my introductions, um, and I will leave with the question. Um, what is sexual justice? What does sexual justice demand institutionally, politically, ethically and aesthetically? How do we envision sexual justice within and across activisms and intimacies inside and beside pandemic life? So uh, we will start with Che Gossett and go down the row. Also, there's lots of like snacks and coffee, so make sure you get that at the end of the event. Okay, I'll turn it over to you. Cool. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Joe, and to Rod, and to the amazing um, co Brudner Roundtable panelists. It's such an honor to be here, um, and especially someone who's been reading your 
individual and collective work for, for many years. Um, I appreciate this invitation uh, to think through this question of um, sexual justice. Uh, so, so I'm just gonna be reading and thinking through sexual justice through the aesthetic, through art, uh, through black trans art in the afterlife of slavery and um, hopefully during the uh, kind of Q&A can talk through some of the cardinal points or orientation points that you brought up, Joe, that kind of anchor this, this conversation. So I want to open with a quote by Horton Spillers. Um, <clears throat> in order to name the black woman in the sexual, the investigator is obliged to back all the way up to that suspenseful chapter in the unfolding of subjecthood, which begins for Africanity in the West, not with a body which one sees well enough, but with, that, with, with which that body was made to mean, with what that body was made to mean, via the powerful grammars of capture. Building on black feminist and literature professor Hortense Spillers's theoretical articulation of grammars of capture, my work considers how gra these grammars function as the political vernacular through which carceral regimes are both rehearsed and renewed. I examine aesthetic objects and cinematic interventions made by black radical queer and trans performers and artists and writers, <clears throat> and how these interventions perform a deconstruction of the, what she calls the grammars of capture and the carceral metaphysics of the subject by marshalling fugitive forms of aesthetics and untraditional archives. So in this brief talk or segment, I think through the work of my sibling, the trans art, black trans artist, Tourmaline, and how she engages in what Sadia Hartman terms critical fabula fabulation in resistance to the aesthetic and racial regime of the archive of slavery, at the same time in resistance to the normative and neoliberal politics of what today we call trans visibility in our contemporary moment. Black trans historical figures are fugitive to the terms of the official archive, except in moments of criminalization, wherein they appear through the register of the police record or the court transcript, which is where the 1836 case of Mary Jones enters into the realm of historical legibility and visibility. I first encountered the historical figure of Mary Jones in Tavia Nyong'o, who is here, who, who does amazing work, in his uh, text, Amalgamation Waltz. And like any proper archivist, I immediately rushed to order the court transcript. Jones was arrested in 1836. She was a sex worker in New York City. Um, she was brought into court, sensationalized through like a lithograph that circulated, went viral for this early age of print media, and also was interrogated for her gender uh, in the courtroom. And it was this spectac spectacle and political theater um, and so in the courtroom, she's asked, you know, who, te who taught you to dress this way? And she replies defiantly, um, I've always dressed this way amongst people of my own color. Um, and so that always is really profound in terms of thinking about black trans temporalities and existence and resistance. <clears throat> so in uh, Salacia, Tourmaline's film uh, about Mary Jones, which is an aesthetic mediation and critical fabulation of her biography, Jones is played by actor Rowan Amon, who's pictured here. Tourmaline's work moves in the liminal space between the historical record of black trans life as well as the realm of the magical. It is black queer and trans speculation, part of an aesthetic legacy and genealogy in the tradition of Octavia Butler, who Rod is gracing our presence with in his t-shirt. Uh, Chip Delaney, and also the milieu of such films, insurgent aesthetics of such films as Born in Flames, that guides the optics of Salacia. The short film takes place in Seneca Village, a putatively free black enclave that was eventually destroyed, showing the ruse of black property ownership, property in self or of objects, and it was raised to erect what is now Central Park, and that happened in the 1850s. Salacia dramatizes the intramural tensions that cut across and through the black community, a community rendered always already under duress by slave catchers in the North 
as well as the, uh, what Frank Wilderson calls the emergency of civil society itself. A black abolitionist, Peter Dermott, runs both a free press and a boarding house and watches with disdain out the window as Jones engages in illicit sex work and trade with white men outside. The intramural then is not without its fractures and fissions. Man monster posters surround the city, which actually happened uh, in, in the historical record. And these lithographs are pasted to walls and trees, signifying that Jones is wanted. The entire community is also subject always to imminent capture. Jones' situation there is both the collective and intramural one, but also the particular predicament of black trans fugitivity. Dermot disapproves of Jones' immorality and vice, but still provides her refuse. refuge. In the version of the film installed at the Brooklyn Museum, which was this amazing kind of 50th anniversary exhibition um, uh, commemorating Stonewall, titled Nobody Promised You Tomorrow, uh, which is, was a Marsha P. Johnson quote, um, we see uh, the glimpse of a glimmer of an affair. While Dermot judges uh, Jones for her, her carnal sins of the flesh, he is not respected by his, uh, is not protected by respectability. The police storm his home looking for Jones, showing that black life is never safe or protected, and that autonomy is always a quality of whiteness as bodily and communal sovereignty. They threaten to close down his entire establishment. Jones goes on the run. Fugitive, she is cornered, traps, resists, bites, but is overpowered and arrested. She knows magic, however, and this is part of a kind of uh, ode to or um, kind of uh, enactment of uh, black cosmolog cosmological and African indigenous traditions. So she uses magic to tri time travel uh, to the present, which is also part of a black speculative imaginary of 19th century fiction and slave narratives like Frederick Douglass narrative where he gets a magical amulet um, from his friend Sandy that he says is part of the kind of gave him power to overthrow um, Master Covey. So in this film, Jones uses water as a transport and moves through and between time, allowing her to escape the confines of her jail cell. <clears throat> and in doing so, she violates the laws of physics and moves queerly, or what Tavia Nyong'o might call angular, in an angular fashion, across the entanglement of space-time. So in some ways, the film is about what Daphne Brooks calls escapology. And she uses, uh, she escapes, she manages to escape one, one version of capture, the pre-emancipation past, only to be uh, kind of land, to land in another, which would be the, the anti-black president of Central Park. Tourmaline's film asks us to consider the ways in which anti-black and anti-trans temporalities are insufficient for black trans freedom and how the world remains a grammar of capture. The film raises questions about sexual justice and fugitivity and the condition of black trans existence beyond the racialized and anti-trans world. And so I want to end with some questions. What might happen in the realm of the aesthetic which is disallowed and foreclosed in the realm of the political? Where does the aesthetic begin and the political end? Black literary and aesthetic practices have historically been a sphere and an arena where the political and its representative functions racial liberalism slash democracy are left aside for alternative imaginaries or where strict, the strict boundaries between the two dissolve in their interplay. So thinking about Toni Morrison's beloved to Sutton Griggs, uh, fictional imagining of a sovereign black state. Um, so in both fiction and nonfiction, these instead become areas or genres where political experimentation um, happens and where justice to come is staged. And in Salacia, the philosophical edifice of justice emerges from a vantage point of the runaway slave, the radical ethics of the slave that aims for what Moton and Harney uh, emphatically say, uh, charge or demand, the abolition of a society that could even have prisons its, uh, itself. And so therefore, abolition is an unfinished and open invitation to an emancipatory project that's both interior and exterior, perennial as well. Um, and so I think, I guess, for just to close, um, you know, I, I feel curious about the, the political grammar of sexual justice, given that justice is often part of a grammar of legal capture, 
and incommensurable, you know, justice and the law are often collapsed into each other and conflated. Uh, but of course, there, you know, from Walter Benjamin to Derrida to Martin Luther King Jr., we learn all about. There's a whole wealth of, of uh, kind of study that thinks about the incommensurability of justice and the law. And so I wonder about the, the grammar of sexual justice and perhaps maybe if there might be ways to imagine uh, a new political grammar beyond the idea of justice itself, which kind of carries a baggage um, that's all about like um, reconciliation, restitution, two sides that come into kind of a cosmic balance. And so I guess I have that left as an open question for us to all consider together. Thank you. Can you hear me? Okay. So I want to thank Professor Fischel for the invitation. It's great to be here and among such uh, great scholars. Uh, what is sexual justice? So since I wrote uh, my book, Intimate Justice, and the North American uh, Necropolitics and Gender that Professor Fischel's students read, I've learned a great deal from black feminist, sovereign, queer and trans abolitionists, namely from Beth Ritchie, Dana Milian, Nick Estes, and Mel Melanie Yazzie, Kathy Cohen, Eric Stanley, Dean Spade, Miriam Kaba, and Andrea Ritchie. So I've learned about the role of police, not only in enforcing gender normativity, policing gender and gender expression, but also in the disproportionate interpersonal violence that black women experience. So my book and the article, I think, focused on intim intimate interpersonal violence and really on that as opposed to state violence. And these authors, as well as activist formations, including Insight and Kaba's Survived and Punished, have helped me to see more clearly something like intimate state violence. So that includes the role of police and policing, as well as, well as a broader tough on crime approach in perpetuating violence against women, particularly uh, black women who violate gender norms, though black women violate gender norms by their existence in some sense. Now, but also uh, in escal not only in perpetuating the violence, but in escalating the interpersonal violence, gender-based violence that they experience. Now, my current research uh, looks at the politics of black death and how black politics from lynching to the movement for black lives has centered spectacular death. This presents a problem for black women who are less likely to be killed in spectacular, in the spectacular ways that cis black men are. Men are more likely to be killed in public generally by acquaintances and strangers, and in the era inaugurated by the Rodney King beating, more likely to have the violence and death that they experience filmed and circulated. Women, on the other hand, are more likely to be killed in private, by intimates, and because of intimacy. This is often even the case when black women are killed by police. So Andrea Ritchie states that police brutality against black women takes place inside the home and it is often unseen as a result. So here, Breonna Taylor's death echoes the deaths of many black women whose names we are now called upon to say, including Eleanor Bumpers, Ayanna Stanley Jones, Atatiana Jefferson, Katherine Johnson, Charlena Lyles, and Pearlie Golden. So much of the violence takes place inside the home, in welfare offices, patrol cars, or even in precincts as women attempt to report intimate partner violence. A significant portion of the violence happens when black and other marginalized women ask for help in their intimate relationships. So in the violence and death that occurs at the intersection of the war on drugs and the sphere of intimate relations, as was the case with Taylor, so a warrant was issued for Taylor's arrest because of her so association, her intimacy with her former partner, and she's now dead. Here, no-knock warrants themselves continue this country's brutal and often de deadly regulation of the black intimate sphere. 
Now, as the organization, and I say, as the organization survived and punished, co-founded by the incomparable uh, Miriam Kaba, abolitionist organizer, uh, this organization argues effectively that jails and prisons and not rape crisis centers and women's shelters actually represent our collective institutional response to the problem of gender-based violence against black and other marginalized women. So the ACLU estimates that almost 60% of, of uh, people in women's prisons worldwide are survivors of violence, and at some prisons, this number is as high as 94%. Now, I want to be clear to mark the distinction between sex and sexual violence here, though I also want to be clear that women are experiencing sexual violence in this institutional context because they are in intimate relationships and have had sex. I want to mark the fact that black women are being murdered, killed, severely hurt, and punished ultimately because they have had sex. And this creates significant political and organizational problems. But my research looks not only at this aspect, but also at what I've uh, come to call black women's death work. So here, women like Ida B. Wells, Mamie Till Bradley, that is Emmett Till's mom, and Clementine Barfield of Detroit's Save Our Sons and Daughters, also known as So Sad, uh, which is an organization of the mothers of murdered children founded in the 1980s and connected to our current era and its own politics of death. As Trayvon Martin's mother contacted So Sad's Philadelphia chapter, and they were among the first to bring attention to the death of her son. So each of these women made transformational contributions to the black counter public sphere, and their entry into that public sphere was authorized by a man's death. Now the subtitle for my uh, section on Madam Wells is uh, Wells and the Empirical Miracle. And I talk about how she constructs a black truth apparatus from broken white parts. And she's the first to use a lynching photo in anti-lynching work, a strategy that we know will be repeated for years to come. But she also commissions a portrait of herself uh, with her murdered friend, Thomas Moss's family. And Lee Rayford says that this represents her important expansion of the lynching photo genre, bringing the family left behind into the frame of anti-lynching activism. Now, I'm in the process of writing the section on Barfield and So Sad, and I could literally go on for hours about them, but let me just say that the organization was extraordinary. So two weeks after one of her sons was killed and another gravely injured, in an act of teen violence, Barfield organized a meeting for families affected by violence against children and teens. The resulting organization became, according to youth violence expert and former assistant dean of Harvard School of Public Health, De Deborah Prothero Stith, a quote, model for community-based activism for organizing for the rest of the country. So sad would go on to have an impact on national conversations regarding youth violence and at its peak, receive requests for organizing help from Milwaukee, St. Louis, Atlanta, Los Angeles, San Francisco, Columbus, and Omaha. Chapters were started in Flint, Michigan, Fresno, Birmingham, Alabama, St. Louis, and St. Louis. Um, and I told you about the Philadelphia chapter, which is, was the largest and perhaps most important. Now they ran a grief support group uh, for the mothers of murdered children. Uh, the support group would expand to include a family support group, a male grief support group, a child counseling group, a survivors of violence group. It, uh, they ran a 24-hour crisis hotline and provided mental health services for children who hurt. They organized a crisis intervention team that went into schools, churches, and door-to-door -door neighborhoods after area deaths. They had a speaker's bureau, a monthly newsletter with columns by Barfield and James Boggs, a weekly radio show, they kick-started the urban gardening movement with their harvesting program, and they even organized in prisons. Now, members of the organization held an explicit theory of what allowed violence to proliferate in the community, and that was the seating of public state space. So Barfield would say, instead of hiding behind bar doors and windows, we can and must march out of our homes and our churches and begin walking the streets in large and small groups uh, making clear to everyone, young and old, that we are reclaiming our communities, looking out for each other, and saving our sons and daughters. Earlier in the same column, Barfield would say, every time one of our sons and daughters is killed, we must march, we must hold candlelight vigils, we must create people's memorials to show that we care, we must not allow Darnell Byrd, Gary Irwin, and Otis Haley, or any of our lost loved ones to be turned into faceless statistics. On street corners, like Joy and Evergreen, we must paint their portraits to remind us that each one of them was someone's son, someone's brother, someone's friend. 
We have to physically plant ourselves, she said, and she would make reference to trees a lot. Um, at the scene of every shooting or homicide in our neighborhood, we must make hope visible. Our children need to see with their own eyes in the midst of devastation that people are standing together and struggling for a better world. But this was not all, right? So she says, we had to organize to rebuild our communities. Everyone can do something. We can march against the crack house on our block. We can develop tr uh, treatment programs. We can transform vacant lots into community gardens and children's parks where kids can play together. We can work towards creating small businesses to provide jobs. We can organize block parties and festivals to celebrate the positive achievements of youth. Now justice then was not about punishment, but the work of building a better world. Justice for the women's dead children was bringing about an end to death worlds and creating life worlds in their place. Communing, however, with death, children, death world, dead children, even as they built these life worlds. So significantly, they had a much more sophisticated understanding of the causes of violence, and at times an implicit um, but often explicit critique of the war on drugs and the carceral state approach to violence. Additionally, they embraced a form of community accountability that, I, that is endorsed by contemporary abolitionists. So Melinda Price, who's written on the organization, says, through their relationship with their children, both dead and living, and here, Price is referring to what she is calling the afterlife of black motherhood, where these organizations, uh, or, organized mothers of murder, murdered children continue to parent their children by creating nurturing com communities for kids amidst the violence and destruction of urban abandonment and the war on drugs, that is life worlds in the midst of death worlds. But Price continues, they crafted public roles to solve complex problems at its roots. In this sense, their analysis was more complex and astute than the analysis that informed any government program. They understood that solving the problem of violence against and among black children meant surrounding them with love, building healthy self-esteem, and finding meaningful work for teenagers on the cusp of adulthood. So I'm thinking about the relationship between Wells, Till Bradley, and Barfield's death work for racial justice and the death work that must be done for the women who die because they have had sex today. Now, someone pointed out the difference in the public's acceptance of grief in public for the mothers of a murdered child and their life world, life world creating grief in public. And the difference between that, right, and um, grief in public for women who've had sex. And I think this is an important point. But as I've thought about it, I realized that Price reminds us that at the time of Sosad's work, the predominant understandings of the black woman, the black mother, was the welfare queen and the crack fiend. So these women had no easy road to hope. And perhaps the gap between these two archetypes, archetypes is not as far apart as we might think. In any case, just this week, I became struck by the similarity of Barfield and Kaba's theory of what justice demands. So across three to four decades, they seem to have come to the same conclusion, and you may or may not be surprised to learn that it aligns with the conclusions of Iris Marion Young, that justice requires participation, participatory democracy, that we cannot create something good with which we are not all involved in making. So institutionally, the tough on crime approach must end for there to be sexual justice, but we must all be involved in the creating of institutions. I can't say what I think sexual justice will look like. Like Barfield and Kaba, I believe that we all have to say that collectively together. And I do believe that like them, we can't have it if we abdicate our collective responsibility for providing sexual safety for us all. But I do think that it will involve all of us creating life worlds of the kind that Barfield's organization attempted to do. Thank you. I'm going to stand up, but I, I don't have any slides, but I <laughs> thought I'd stand, so. Um, okay, so I'm talking about sexual justice, and I'm taking sexual down to its, its root, sex. And by sex, I mean sex as an M or F or X, not as sex as in having sex. So that's my sex part. The justice, I think, we'll, cover, we'll get to around the end. So, but one other short note on language. Um, Many people would use gender to talk about the marks on our driver's license and the passports and so on, but I use the word sex, and let me explain why. 
this is the thing. I can either see you or I can see my paper. So I think I'll see my paper and then you're all blurry. Oh, well. Also, can folks hear? Yeah. Okay. Um, so most, um, a, lot, a lot of my work has focused on how state actors define the word sex or decide who's M or who's F or who's F, X. Um, and I am not interested in evaluate, evaluating the correctness of different claims to deciding on who's M or F. F or X. So what I do is I look at what different definitions make possible. So I don't know what sex is. I don't know what the right thing is. I'm just like, let's see what a definition by the, that the, a government agency puts forward that's backed by the force of law. Force of law. What effects that has? So, so I use gender though. I still use the word gender, but I refer to by gender. I, I refer to like uh, shared, though often contested norms, narratives, practices, and conventions that arrange bodies, identities, roles, and expressions and hierarchies of difference based on binary notions of male and female, masculine and feminine, um, and so on. So just a little introduction. So in the last month, Supreme Court nominee Katanji Brown Jackson was castigated by a Republican senator for refusing to define the word woman in her nomination hearings. A week later, the Biden administration announced that individuals will have the option of choosing X as the gender marker on their passport. Oh, I should say sex marker, sorry. Um, so it's quite a weird moment we're at. Um, though the right and the left are like bitterly divided. By the left, I mean the good left, not, not the, my kind of left, not the old lefty boys who don't like trans people. Whether the right and the left are, um, are bitterly divided over the rights of transgender people, activists on both sides agree on one thing. If their side can win the battle of how society as a whole defines a person's sex, Americans will be forced to either give up discriminating against trans people or be allowed to continue discriminating against trans people. So it's like the way the, way the rhetoric kind of moves around, it, it's as if the fate of the republic depends in no small measure on the outcome of the battle over sex definition. But this, no, this, kind of, this notion of a kind of Manichaean battle between the sexes, however, rests on a Upon a, rests on a dramatically mistaken view of how state, federal, and local governments approach the issue of deciding a person's sex. Whether it's on a birth certificate, a driver's license, a marriage certificate, whether it's in a prison, a homeless shelter, a school bathroom. Historically, government agencies have been far less interested in social conventions about what sex is, whether it's biologic, biological assignment at birth, uh, gender identity as an adult, and so on. They're less interested in the perfect, the perfect definition in some abstract platonic way than, what, than in what sex does for that agency's mission. So officials in prison, for example, define sex differently than do officials in the Department of Motor Vehicles, even when those officials work in the same jurisdiction of a single city or state. So sex classifications radically depend in ways that few journalists um, and many and, and scholars and politicians recognize, except we do because we're in this world, uh, um, sex classifications depend on what a government agency, agency is trying to do. So I want to kind of illustrate this by telling a story of New York City. And I'm the kid at the Thanksgiving dinner table who like started to tell a story and by the time I got to the end, no one was paying attention. So, you know, in my 50s, I'm still like, maybe I can tell a story. But here I have a microphone and, you know, you probably won't interrupt me, but I'm gonna try, try to tell a story and not, um, not mess up any punchlines. So, um, in the 1960s, trans people were going to the city and saying, hey, will you change our birth certificates? And the city was like, well, I don't know, that's weird. So they did it a few times, and after a while they were like, I'm not sure this is a good idea. So they asked a bunch of doctors, should we change their birth certificates? The doctors met two or three times, and they were like, no. <laughs> because if you let them change their birth certificates, they might commit a fraud upon the public and um, uh, by like marrying some un unsuspecting person. They, their, their Im image was of a trans woman marrying an unsuspecting cisgender man who would you know, accidentally get married to a trans woman. So they wouldn't change it. Then the 1970s, I think it was the ACLU, or the New York Civil Liberties Union, um, tried to get the city to change its policy. And the city did. It said, okay, this is a weird issue. You know what we're gonna do? We're gonna give you new birth certificates but we're gonna take the box of, for, um, that indicates sex off. There's no box whatsoever. So everybody else has a box that says M or F and trans people's birth certificates, people who are born in the city, there's no box, which isn't great for people who have to present their birth certificates because people who look at birth certificates all day <laughs> say, well, this is a trans person because there's no box here. But anyways, it was something. 
But by the 2000s, New York City, thinking of itself as very progressive, thought, okay, we're a little behind. You know, in the 70s, this might have been a cool policy, but now this is behind. So they con convened a committee, and this is where I come into it as like a, an expert, but probably more of an advocate, actually. Um, they convened a committee to decide, like, okay, what should the right policy be for, uh, for, for uh, letting people change their, their sex marker on their birth certificate? So they had trans health care advocates, transgender rights advocates, they had surgeons, they had psychiatrists, um, um, and of the people who were not on the city's payroll, so some of the people were city officials, but the people who weren't on the city's payroll, most everybody worked hard to convince policymakers to drop the requirement for any kind of surgical or medical intervention. The only people who didn't work for the city who wanted to keep a surgical requirement were surgeons. <laughs> they thought that was a good metric for changing people's sex. The good thing is they made so much money in private practice, coming to a meeting cost them a lot of money, it was pre-Zoom, so they only came to one meeting, so that was actually quite, quite helpful. Um, but we kind of made the usual argument, transition is an individualized process and gender identity, not genitals, should determine sex classification. And initially the Board of Health, which is the group we were working with, agreed to adopt this recommendation. But then they shopped it around to other city agencies. And the other city agencies said, no, this is a terrible policy, we don't agree. And our proposal was shelved uh, for some years. So we decided, the advocates on the committee decided, that this is just plain transphobic. This is like not okay. This is just mean. Um, we, you know, we would talk about the harms that people face when there is a mismatch between the M or the F on a person's identity papers and their gender identity. Um, there's a great quote, one woman who testified to the city official said, she says, I don't suffer from gender dysphoria. I suffer from bureaucratic dysphoria. You know, she kind of talks about the <laughs> problem is the state's problem. Um, so that's like very powerful, and I, I was there when uh, that statement was made. But one thing that, that my thinking has shifted on this is that focusing on the harm to transgender people that these decisions make actually in some sense makes it hard to see what the city was doing like, um, and what their reasoning was. It just seemed transphobic. But as a few years later, as I was doing some research, I came across some material that provided a different perspective. So back in the 60s, when the New York City was trying to figure out what to do, they wrote some official in Washington. They said, well, what do you do, you people at the Bureau of uh, Statistics, or somebody at the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare? Um, and the people, the federal government people wrote back and said, you know, we, we thought about this, and I canvassed a bunch of people from other departments, and we can provide you with no guidance on the question. He said, since various agencies carry out differing responsibilities, the problems which confront them vary. The more we delved into the problem, the more ramifications that cropped up. So this, for me, who's like looking at sex classification stuff, is so fascinating, because they're basically talking about how sex is an instrument of governmentality, though that's not the language they're using, um, and not talking about sex as in some kind of abstract thing. Um, so officials at some agencies, like the Social Security Administration, were worried about identity management and Social Security benefits. They were worried that the selective service people were worried. All the different agencies were like, oh, I'm not sure about this. So in other words, there could be no unified policy on the matter of sex reclassification because each agency would have to investigate the effects of sex reclassification policies on its own work. And then back to the, you know, the 2005 policy that failed, um, a, a transgender rights group sued the city. They said, this is not okay, this is mean. Um, it said that requiring individuals to have surgery uh, before their, their, gender, their birth certificate could, could be changed was arbitrary, capricious, discriminatory and otherwise unlawful. And the law, which is boring, but in the law it's like it's bad to be arbitrary and capricious. There's supposed to be a good reason for things. Um, so the advocates were drawing on medical authorities to argue that sex markers on identity documents should be consistent with the individual's gender identity. Drawing on all this like social science and medical science. Um, so the, the city's policy, according to advocates, was irrational. And the response of the city's lawyers kind of goes back to the response of that federal official in the 1960s. They argued that the existence of different approaches to sex classification does not render an agency's rule irrational. For the city, the rationality of each agency's approach to sex classification depended on what the agency did on its remit, not on what sex is in itself. So the, de the debate on sex was taking place in two different registers. So the advocates, including myself, we were thinking about experts and truth and what, how to really think about what sex is. And the bureaucrats were thinking about governing, about like what a sex classification would do to a prison or a homeless shelter or a different agency. Um, so 
for the city, um, how sex was defined um, could be changed depending on agent, uh, by agency by agency, depending on the need. So I like to tell this story because it shows how advocates, including myself, working on this issue, went into the process thinking the point was to agree on some right definition of sex. But it turned out that the city bureaucrats and lawyers are the real Foucauldians, understanding that sex was not a thing in itself, but something instrumentalized differently by different agencies. So, so much scholarship and advocacy has been taken up with arguing that it's unjust to use traditional ideas about gender to require transgender people to have surgery before changing their sex classification or to prevent any changes at all. A lot of like, that is just wrong, and I agree with that, it is wrong. But from these precincts, we also hear that sex and gender are so complicated that the only workable solution is to base sex classification on gender identity. And I don't disagree with that either. But the other assumption that bad policies are the result of transphobia and that good policies are not doesn't help us understand how every one of them fixes us in a place, implicates us in a relation to state power that might allow some reforms of sex classification but draws our attention away from the other half of the equation, state power. So we spent a lot of time denaturalizing sex, but like we're not so good at denaturalizing the state. You know what I mean? We're like, we've no one reads Marx anymore, you know. I mean, maybe he's coming, maybe he's getting trendy recently, but so the proposition, and I was doing this paper this morning, I was like, boy, like every paper a political theorist ever presents is really just another version of Marx's on the Jewish question. So I, I apologize for that. I guess that that's the tradition I'm in. But um, but the proposition that sex is manufactured in and through regulations formal and informal policies, judicial decisions, and legislative enactments does not mean that we should see the state as fixed in place, still in heart as a monument. That sex is an output doesn't mean that we should black box the state, like turn it into a thing that we don't look into its inner, inner doings. Um, so before I conclude, one last, one last word about the New York City situation. New York City now has a great policy. You can change it to F to M to X, you don't need a doctor's letter, you don't need any medical intervention. That's all really, it's the perfect policy. But um, it's not like the city finally agreed that sex really should be gender identity. It was because the new logic of identity politics meant that the, the de Blasio administration could give this constituency what it wanted. You say, I can give you in the press release, we're getting transgender people what they want. But everybody else born in the city still gets an M or an F on, on their birth certificate. So we're still kind of trapped in this arithmetic of identity politics of demands made and demands met. So to conclude, to return to the perilous moment in which we find ourselves, where we have passage of legislation targeting trans youth and those who care for them, bills including trans girls from sports, don't say gay bills, the organized attack on what's taken to be gender ideology. I mean, that's more outside the United States, but. As scary as this moment is, I see two positive or exciting, hopefully they're exciting possibilities. First, sex classification has always been instrumentalized um, for the purposes of governance. That's, we're, already, we've, we're already there. But what was previously a relatively secretive internal decision of government bureaucrats concerned with the efficiency and effectiveness of their agencies and particular state projects has very recently become a boisterous public debate. For the first time, the decision about gender identity has the potential to be democratic, not only deliberated by the people, but with the interests and concerns of the people most affected by those policies, trans people taken into account. Second, as we put the needs of transgender people front and center in deliberations about sex classification, it's also an opportunity to shine the spotlight on the other side of this mutually constitutive relationship, the governing apparatuses that determine what a livable life looks like. So we can get sex classification right, we can you know, fight in the democratic public sphere for that, that's good, but it's also important to kind of point out like, if we can get everybody's, every jurisdiction's, every agency's sex classification policy right, but the changes that would make, would then improve the lives of the most trans people are not those changes, right? Change, those changes would be having a public, public um, having um, public health, um, a national health care plan, um, prison abolition and like radically reducing, if not eliminating, in income equality. Those are the things that would change most people's lives. Um, so as we contest the classifications, the exclusions from public life, the attacks, the CPS investigations, this is also a moment to turn the spotlight not on sex but back to the state and think about the very architecture of justice that distributes inequality. So, thank you.
So I want to start by um, thanking Joe and Gender Studies for uh, inviting me to sit on this panel alongside um, three people whose work is, is tremendously influential, um, both in my, my prior book um, and, and particularly in some of what I'm working on now. Um, so I'm the one who's going to talk about sex because this is an LGBT studies thing and, you know, it, it, it's, it's time. It's time. We're going to talk about, we're going to talk about, I'm going to put the sex in sexual justice. Um, so I'm a microsociologist, which means that I study themes of intimacy recognition um, from a kind of perspective that foregrounds face-to-face -face interaction and thinking through the ways in which we live social structures on, uh, in our most intimate uh, lives and moments. And so I'm going to be talking a little bit today about what sexual justice demands of us interpersonally. So for the last several years up until uh, COVID made it impossible, I was conducting ethnographic research in several different BDSM communities. Now I'm guessing that, that if you're at an LGBT studies uh, talk, it, this is not the first time you've heard the term BDSM. But when I talk about it, really what I'm focusing on is sets of erotic practices and, 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 and emotional practices um, that rely on a hierarchical organization of power between uh, people. And as I began to do the writing of what will be this ethnographic book, I realized that a lot of what I was learning was about the erotic life of social difference, how differences between people related to gender, sexuality, race, class, nationality, religion, and age become activated, even electrified, by the erotic, brought into focus crystallized in the moment. Now, the ways sexuality makes gender turn technicolor or uh, makes racial difference animated, how social roles anchored in power like teacher-student, for example, which we were talking about at lunch today, uh, gather intense affect. And usually we think of these things in negative terms, right, as structures of power underlying bodily forms of violence like rape and psychic forms of violence like sexual racism. Uh, and these are, you know, deeply important social pathologies. But on some level, I think it lets nonviolent sex off the hook um, by way of locating unjust sexuality only in moments of non-consensual violence, right? Whether it's structural or interpersonal. And so I want to focus on um, two epistemological responses um, to uh, sort of transgressive sexuality that I think are complicit in this exceptionalizing of violence um, in, in non-consensual forms of sexuality. So the first is a framework common in queer, social, and psychoanalytic theory that positions redemptive sexuality as antisocial, anti-rational, and ego-shattering, to use Leo Bersani's formulation or the more popular, often attributed to feminist notion that sex is either presumptively egalitarian and thus good, or it sits in relation to trauma as either itself traumatic, the cause of trauma, or a means of repairing it. And I wanna offer two observations from my work, both of which are preliminary. See, here's the thing about doing empirical work. If you really, like, real people keep you kind of intellectually honest in a certain way, and so I think that they're, that they're, they're often a good place to start, right? Like, when we're thinking about how things work in the world. So I wanna, I wanna say two things today. First, um, I wanna argue for something that I'm coming to call articulate intimacy, which one might even consider a hyper-rational orientation towards desire and pleasure. And second, I'm gonna suggest that we think differently than queer theorists often do about the connection between pleasure and negative affect, right? Um, there, to, that we think about ways to imagine states beyond pleasure that facilitate eroticized forms of intimacy that are deeply grounded in social location. So BDSM is what sociologists call an extreme case of intimate relation. Um, in the sense that we view it as deviant or exceptional, in the sense that we have a sense that this is not what most people do. But BDSM is also, as Ariana Cruz writes, an aperture through which to view some of the architecture of the sexual order more generally. So in my travels through BDSM subcultures, I met people who engaged in various forms of psychological and erotic play that traffic in social difference. 
race play, rape play, Nazi play. These are some examples. And in my conversations with these practitioners, women and people of color had extremely articulate relationships to their play, particularly those who occupy the minoritarian positions in erotic encounters with others. Men and white people of all genders struggled more with articulating their investments or individual level experiences with reproducing most particularly racialized domination in their play. And I began thinking about the inarticulateness of whiteness as perhaps a, one of the biggest barriers to sexual justice on the dyadic level. And this is different from, you know, what we hear about on NPR um, when they're talking about white fragility, right, which is a state of kind of collapse into defensiveness or anger at the challenge of racial accountability, right? This is a failure of cultural language for attempting not merely accountability, but an accounting for uh, the racialized nature of all of our desires. So, um, th and this wasn't, this wasn't only um, the case for my subjects, this is true of dominant queer theory as well. I'm thinking of the work of Tim Dean, David Halperin, Leo Borsani, and others, um, mostly coming from white gay male, per gay male perspectives, and some newer work in psychoanalysis that foregrounds the dissolution of the self in the act of sex um, and uh, as, as kind of like the redemptive potential of, of transgressive sexuality. Um, it's a kind of, and, and there's, a, there's a whole train of thought in sociology as well that, that has a kind of um, fantastical notion of the sexual uh, and sexual communities as, as, space, as spaces that are acutely amenable to transcending social difference, right? On the other hand, black feminist writing by Ariana Cruz, Amber Mooser, Jennifer Nash, and others um, describes a form of black and brown jouissance that comes from a highly racialized affect, from attending to the pleasures that are possible by taking seriously the legacies of trauma and rupture that define the current racial moment. Even by using negative affect, not to efface the self, but to confront it more deeply and honestly than the sexual terrain of egalitarian allow, egalitarianism allows. And I say this not as a judgment of my white subjects as individuals, many of whom were engaged in earnest efforts toward accountability in their intimate lives. And indeed, BDSM in its ideal form, at least in the communities that I studied, is itself a form of articulate intimacy, by which I mean it is a form of relationship to others that has a meta-narrative about itself, that accounts for specific articulations of power that exist within a structure of accountability that ensures not merely consent, but a specific forms of self-reflection. The problem is that there were few linguistic conventions for people to draw on for formulating racialized desires outside of tropes of colorblindness, objectification, or exclusion. So some use the sexual to find new grammars, some means of encounter that coalesce outside of language, ways of eroticizing in the body what can be so difficult to narrate interpersonally. So I really struggled with deciding what anecdote um, from my fieldwork to share with you in the brief moments that I have for this provocation. And so I scrolled through my Rolodex of favorite perverts. The Upper East Side, <laughs> it's really, it's getting bigger every minute. <laughs> The Upper East Side heterosexual Jewish couple who enjoyed Nazi play on Shabbat. The black, white, lesbian couple married for 20 years who engaged in practices of objectification and the iconography of slavery. The Normcore couple who maintained a 1950s household. The American and Eastern European couple who did mail order bride play. Or the time I was invited to participate in an interrogation scene by a well-known black female dominant all would have led me to kind of the same set of conclusions, that even in a context of acute attunement to power, social differences produce what uh, Rachel Gorman calls a quagmire of affect, a hazardous terrain of inarticulate or invisible whiteness that overdetermines what we know how to think, what we know, how we know to feel, and what we are able to say. People of color who I interviewed explicitly understood and, and women as well, either gendered or racialized play as either reformatting objectification into recognition, reversing the terms of subjectification by either consenting to it and thus not fully being a, 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 an object, but in fact being a subject of it, repeating it to gain mastery, or spinning the iconography to subjectify either maleness or whiteness. 
They tied it to emotional states like fear, aggression, grief, shame, humiliation, but always in context with the very specificity of their identities. And indeed, BDSM identities themselves often merge sexual practices uh, with orientations to their an individual's particular constellation of gender, racial, and sexual identification. So sociologists have written um, a lot about how, you know, the sort of contemporary moment is a moment of specialized erotic subcultures, right? And these erotic subcultures often trade not merely in what we want to do with one another or to one another, but in, in the very particularity of our identities. And I mean that, you know, in a deeply intersectional way. White subjects understood or really offloaded their racialized investments onto their partners. I think of one white uh, man who did race play with his black partner. I am here to help her with her process of reckoning, he said, with what was done by my forefathers to hers, right? So um, I'm wondering if I have time to tell one uh, quick story. I don't really, but I mean, there's so many stories that I could tell in which um, you know, sort of that, that reproduce this, including um, ways in which I was uh, recruited by subjects to take place in racialized scenes that forced me to kind of confront my own articulateness, inarticulateness about what it would mean for me to do that. And I, I say this not to collapse into like an erotophobic discussion about why, you know, we should or shouldn't touch research subjects. I have a whole paper on that if you're interested. Um, uh, and I, I have a whole, uh, yes, I have a whole paper on that. Um, but really like struggling with the provocation made by Tiffany King and many others, for those of us working on issues of social difference from the position of whiteness to really examine our investments in racialization or in avoiding its capture. And I was thinking when Che was talking earlier that um, about, about political uh, experiments beyond restitution, that the interpersonal domain in a context of trust, in a context of mutuality, is a place where many people are doing some of these experiments in more just means of attachment to one another. Um, and, and I think that, it, that, that I kind of want to argue for an agenda that foregrounds um, uh, what issues of justice require of us in our most intimate encounters with others, right? And to confront how we're going to confront these affective and linguistic failures that so many of us um, were enculturated into. But like most things that are worth deep consideration, this is not a new idea. In fact, Robert Reed Farr articulated this in 1998 when he wrote, quote, and I'm going to end on this idea, what is difficult to accept is the idea that the sexual act, at least it is, as it is performed by queers, is not necessarily a good, expansive, or liberatory thing a place in which individuals exist for a moment outside of themselves such that new possibilities are at once imagined and articulated. Indeed, I'm suggesting that this notion is itself predicated upon the articulation of a set of false boundaries. We do not escape race and racism when we fuck. On the contrary, this fantasy of escape is precisely that which marks the sexual act as deeply implicated in the ideological processes by which difference is constructed and maintained. The task that awaits all of us then is to speak desire plainly, to pay attention to what we think when we fuck. More, in the, it is the particular task of white men to give up the comforts of naivete, of banal gestures to racial inclusion. Indeed, the work before us is precisely to put our own bodies on the line. We must refuse to allow the production of a queer theory so reified that it does nothing to challenge the way we interact, the way we think, and the way we fuck. We must not only think as we fuck, but also pay close attention to all the implications, good and bad, of those sometimes startling thoughts. Thank you. Um, thank you all so much. That was terrific. Um, I think we could just move to uh, your questions. Um, I don't think there's a mic there, so maybe I'll run around with the mic. Does that, yeah, okay. Uh, but I think I'll turn it to you all. If there's that awkward silence, I'll go first. Wait, is that a question? Yeah, amazing. Here. Yeah, um, thank you all so much for coming to me today. Thank you so much to Joe for organizing this. I have a question for Professor Joyce Bafford, and I also wanted to address it. Um, my question is in kind of other ways that we should think about. Okay, totally. <laughs> thank you. Um, oh. <laughs> um, I know you were talking about 
kind of how to disrupt the violence that occurs within the home by like bringing grief into public space. Mm -hmm. I'm interested if you or if anyone else has other like thoughts on how to, yeah, on how to disrupt like just the interpersonal violence that occurs within the home and like what are other ways to bring like women who have sex or like women who are murdered because they have sex into public space and like what are the, the ideas you have about that or thoughts? Do you want me to answer yeah. that? Okay. okay. I don't know why I did that. Um, no, so this is something that I'm, I'm really still thinking about. This is, I'm what, three fifths of the way through the book now. Um, so I'm thinking about community accountability and about um, what our our own what our collective responsibility towards um, interrupting uh, violence I think uh, Joe posed the question about aesthetics I think that has an important role and my students have talked um, in in really convincing ways about uh, what the role of art is and in and, and interrupting rape culture and and uh, I think Students are most comfortable thinking that education is the way in which we have to do, in which we uh, access and put into practice our collective responsibilities. Um, but it is something that I'm still thinking through, and I actually would welcome if the panel, other panelists have something to say about it. But I am early in thinking about what this means. I do, uh, yeah. I'll just say that, that, that I, I know that it's about uh, a line between publicity and privacy, right? So I mean, playing on the public-private divide and specifically an intersectional public-private divide where black women have never belonged in private in the same way that black men kind of don't belong in public space and their decision um, to, to bring the grief into the public when they didn't have any real private, right, is, is an important one and trying to figure out uh, the ways in which to make these forms of violence more visible is, is the thing that brought me to this project, right? And so the fact that um, uh, Barfield is thinking constantly about memorialization, about statues, about artwork, about making people into more than statistics into making that visible, I think has something very, like is, is an important part of this, but it's about, you know, I could go off on a whole tangent about how Les Moonves was at CBS and canceled designing women and this like inner and then put a generation of murdered women on TV, right? And, and put that into our visual culture and what it means that Tarana Burke has a movie deal and how I think that that is important for thinking about um, how we interrupt those kinds of things. So those, that's my not quite there yet, but the, the things that are moving around in my head about it. Thank you. Um, I guess this is on. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I just wanted to, to, I appreciate the question so much and, um, and your presentation so much. And I really, it made me think a lot about visual justice, mm -hmm. especially like the Adi B. Wells mm -hmm. image where she inserts herself in the picture and then brings everybody who's not in the picture into the fold. Yep. And that was so moving. Um, and I also, I think the question in your presentation ma makes me think about black trans women being killed both um, in private and in public in spectacular ways. Yeah. But despite the kind of spectacle, horrifying spectacle of, of that violence, um, there's not the political mobilization as a response to it. Mm -hmm. And so it just made me think about that uh, until really recently, like I think it was last summer, I went to a, um, Black Trans Pride March in Brooklyn, outside of the Brooklyn Museum, and there were like 10 to 15,000 people. Hmm. And that was unprecedented, which felt like such a moving event, hmm. but the, the, like how to sustain that momentum um, in between the marches, it uh, is still like an ongoing, like how to do that, you know? So, um, like beyond visibility, basically. Yeah. Yeah. Should I, should, should, yeah, I mean, I, I wrote this down because I think that there's so much to think about, about um, 
you know, in captive genders where they talk about the phenomenon of overkill, mm -hmm. but no, uh, no one writes about it, right? So we know that we only find out about black women being killed when they're killed in the same news cycle or by the same departments that kill black mm -hmm. men, right? And, and so uh, it follows that it would be worse in a situation where there's a suppression of information and I'm not gonna talk about it for black trans women that mm -hmm. you just, we're not, we won't know, so we don't talk about it, right? And, but the, the moving in the public-private divide is really, is tremendous. But I do think that, you know, um, as with Stonewall, as with uh, uh, Save Our Sons and Daughters, right, as with, um, you know, Antifa, right, never let a Nazi hold the street, right, being in the public, right, and, and decision to occupy public space is a part of what this is, right? And, and, and being there, being out, right? And mm -hmm. is a part of the solution. And, and, and so even if it can't ever be 10,000, or you know, there are only gonna be um, sporadic times mm -hmm. when it's gonna be that many, like it is thinking about the other ways to keep us right there mm -hmm. is, is, the, mm -hmm. is the thing that we're fighting for, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, go for it. Hi, uh, I'm Olivia. Thanks so much um, for your talk. Um, so listening to all of you speak has me thinking about, um, and this question has me thinking about M. Jackie Alexander's idea of the palimpsest, right, which would have us think that colonial forms of violence have an arrangement, right, of like here and there and then and now, near the twain shall meet. Um, and it seems like all of you are kind of invoking the importance of at least some kind of palimpsestic way of thinking, of we're thinking about um, here and um, here and now and then and there. Um, because I teach many of your uh, works, um, I'm wondering if you guys can talk about um, the kind of pedagogical implications of this palimpsestic way of thinking or you know, however you choose to interpret the way that you are all thinking about historical contingencies here and there, then and now, um, for actually kind of um, bringing about the various forms of sexual justice you're invested in. Um, so I guess a short version of the question is, how does thinking about the sort of deep histories um, in all of your work, um, how does that play a key role in sort of thinking about um, and manifesting an idea of sexual justice? Uh, you got, I'm going to take the liberty of a follow-up, which is uh, there's a strain, like a Sedgwickian, uh, Eve Sedgwickian strain of, you know, the emphasis on the reparative and not to get caught in the paranoid, right? And the kinds of ways that the paranoid can be circular. And so I just want to, I want you to answer that question. I mean, but, but to think, how, can you think the palimpsestic along with, you know, how do you think the palimpsestic and also the reparative at the same time? I'll leave it there, right? Or is the palimpsestic always, is it always kind of a paranoid turn? Does it have to be, do you see where I'm going? Answer, okay, go, go, go with Olivia first, yeah. <laughs> well, I, I mean, is the word palimpsest? I'm so bad at English, um, but anyways. Oh, yeah, it's a phenomenon you know, You write over and over. Right, right. I think between the mask and my, like, fear of my terrible vocabulary, I was like, is that the word? Um, I think for me, in terms of pedagogically, like, you know, I teach at Brooklyn College, and, like, the last few semesters, I've been almost the only white person in the room. So I feel like, I feel like my role in this situation can be in classes of like intro to political theory. I can try to historicize sexual injustices. They don't really, a lot of those folks, and maybe they need details, but they don't need my help historicizing questions of like structural inequality or histories of racism. So it can be like a, in terms of the com mutual conversation between professor and students and our different locations of privilege, it could be like, really generative, but I feel like I learn more from being in a room with people who are, you know, living in this, colonial, you know, never ending colonial moment to, in terms of that, that informing my own work on what we're calling today se sexual justice, so. Yeah, I mean, I, I resonate with that idea in the sense that part of the intervention that I think I was trying to make is that the idea that, that the current moment isn't always an overwriting of a past is, is really only a perspective one can hold from a position of incredible privilege, right? And so there's a way in which I think, you know, 
students come into classrooms with an idea of equality that is based in identity for people who uh, have more of a tangential relationship to privilege and based more in a sense of, of uh, sameness for people who have a tremendous degree of privilege, whether that's economic privilege, gender privilege, racial privilege, whatever you want to say. Um, and so I think that, I mean, pedagogy has to meet people where they enter a classroom and move them one step beyond where they came in, right? Like that's what I consider to be a successful uh, a class, right? Is that I've taken somebody one step beyond their starting point and people come from very different starting points, right? And so I think on some level, um, what we have to explain and to whom, as Paisley pointed out, is really um, location dependent. Uh, so, my, um, so I participated in a seminar on the uses of the past, and part of what came out of that for my thinking was, uh, and it's, it's in the book, talking about the power that lynching has on contemporary uh, U.S. black politics, and about the ways in which lynching becomes a way that we talk about things, and the, the significance of that uh, for black women. So very few black women relatively were lynched, about 5%, according to your Crystal Feimster. Um, and uh, many of them were lynched in place of a husband, father, or brother that they couldn't find. Um, and so this, this means a lot, and this is significant. And I think beyond that, uh, to, to talk about Palimpsest, it's the work that Du Bois as the best among, but, uh, but others, many others did to connect lynching and crucifixion, right? So Du Bois has five, six lynching tales where he brings uh, a black Jesus to life in, in the Jim Crow South. He only speaks the words of the biblical Jesus Christ. This indicts everything that goes on and he dies for it. Um, and I think that those, mar the martyr themes, right? The resurrective work, the things that are going on, a powerful story, and, a, and I've said, like a former person here, uh, Roger Smith, who's not here anymore, uh, it's important in the story of black peoplehood, and part of what uh, black women are gonna have to do uh, is uh, tell a new story, right? Because this is a rewriting, rewriting over and over again. Um, when what do we do that black men took the climax of the Bible? But luckily, we have Sadia Hartman and Toni Morrison and others from whom that we can think about how to deal with, with uh, these kinds of deaths and un ungrieved deaths. Uh, but that's going to be the way the, to write a, a new story, to stop writing over the past, and think about how to put one at least um, on a equal footing for thinking about uh, the, the origins of our politics. Um, thank, thank you so much for that question. and. Um, I, I, I felt really like transformed, I guess I would say, by reading Pedagogies of Crossing. And so I um, always feel like, yeah, like Jack Alexander's work um, is like a condition of possibility for my own thinking. And I feel very indebted to, to her labors, critical labors, conceptual labors. Um, and I guess I, y your question makes me think about <clears throat> how to have an abolitionist pedagogy, both inside the university classroom and what that might mean um, as a worker in the university, um, and also inside the space of, of the prison. And like, you know, what does an abolitionist pedagogy look like when you're teaching inside and outside? Um, and uh, it also, you know, I showed some of well, an image from Tourmaline's film, Salacia, and you know, she really like folds time and folds space. And I think part of what that does is like show the ruse of, of racial liberal progress narratives that would tell us that like, for example, cross-dressing is decriminalized when it's not in prisons, right? So I think that like showing the foil of, of this, um, teleological kind of racial liberal um, uh, time zone uh, it is like 
part of what Pamplos says, now I'm like mispronouncing how says, <laughs> part of what that project does. Um, and I think that that is crucial to uh, part of the demystification work that an abolitionist pedagogy can uh, offer, can and does offer. So, thanks. I think maybe one more question. I feel like it's close to seven. Okay, great. Yeah, hi there. Oh, that's loud. I'm, <laughs> I'm Gabby. Thank you so much for, for coming to speak with us. And as you were all talking, I was thinking a lot about sexual injustice beyond questions of consent. You know, like the unjust formation of one's sexual proclivities and preferences, sexual racism, et cetera. And I am curious to hear from any of you how we should approach talking about how desire has a politics and, you know, talking about ways to individually and collectively reckon with that politics uh, without sliding into what, you know, sort of sex positivity advocates would call like prudish or authoritarian sexual moralizing. You want to take that one on? Uh, you know, I mean, I mean, look, it's, it's, it, you know, there are a lot of sociologists right now that have been working on, on sexual racism, right? And, and, and I think that there are these sort of two formulations. One is that, um, that the intimate realm is a place where, you know, it functions as a marketplace, right? So that's that's often how sociologists think about it, right? That 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 there is something called a sexual field in a Bourdieuian sense, in which, you know, different people because of what they look like and their social position have different amounts of erotic capital, and this functions in you know in very predictable ways to disadvantage. Uh, women, people of color, people who don't fit, you know, sort of hegemonic standards of beauty and so forth. And that that is the, the route from which we need to begin to politicize desire. Like, what does it mean to, you know, I mean, it's sort of like, um, like there, there's like a, a website called Douchebags of Grinder, right, for example, where it's just like, basically like all the men's profiles who are like no fats, no femmes, no blacks, you know, like those people. And as if, as if they are, uh, an individual level problem, mm -hmm. right? Whereas um, the, the, the actual problem of desire is so much deeper than bad behavior done publicly by one person, mm -hmm. right? We are all complicit in structures of desire that disadvantage, like, you know, it's kind of like, you know, when, 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 my mother wants to give my daughter lessons about sexuality, which I really never want her to do, ever. Um, and she's just like, date the nice boy. But the truth is, she means like the nice, handsome, you know, boy who's going to be a doctor, right? Like, that's what she means. Um, my daughter has come out as straight. You know, we're, we're processing it in therapy, I'm hoping. I'm hoping, you know, she'll get over it at some point. But, um, because heterosexuality these days seems, as Jane Ward says, fairly tragic. But, um, another panel. Uh, but but I do think that we that 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 we need to that the first step in um, having a different conception of desire and I, I really I hate this masculinist economic framework for understanding desire because I think that it's like you know like everybody some people have got a thicker wallet of desirability than others and I just think that like that that desire um, is is so much more of a. a, a God, multivalent phenomenon, but I do think that we are all complicit in reproducing structures of desire and desirability, both in our presentations of self, in the ways in which we value or devalue other people, even in terms of like, I hope he's a doctor, right? Like that is also a structure of desire, and it's one that doesn't really account for. It's a, it's a, it's a sort of, it's a cruel optimism, as Lauren Berlant would say, right? Like that you, that you imagine who the perfect partner is going to be, and oftentimes that perfect partner is someone then you enter into like a completely miserable marriage with, right? And so really thinking about what are the things that make people desirable, both erotically, right? And maybe it's something like they know what they're doing in bed, right? That would be nice. I mean, I'd like to see the, the, the app that, that kind of tries to get at that <laughs> algorithmically. Um, if, if you know of it, you know, my email's available online. Like, but, it, you know, so I, I mean, I think that part of it is, is understanding our own investments in 
particular forms of partnership, particular forms of erotic engagement, um, as being part and parcel of an overall kind of, uh, right, like a, a structure of affect, right? Thoughts from you guys? Okay, I think I think we're set. One uh, last round of applause for our for our panel.